back. In our last session, we concluded the third missionary journey of Paul. We looked at his departure from Macedonia and Greece, crossing the sea to arrive in Troas. There, he preaches to the community gathered at Troas, during which, a time, during which time a young man named Eutychus fell asleep and fell out of an upper window. Paul was quick to revive him. From Troas, then, he traveled to Miletus, where the elders of the Church of Ephesus were gathered. At Miletus, Paul preached his final time to these elders and bid them farewell. In our current session, we shall look at Paul's departure from Miletus, where he boarded a ship and traveled to Tyre, where he then spent several days. From Tyre, he will travel to Caesarea, stopping briefly at Talabaeus. In Caesarea, Paul will visit the house of Philip and encounter a seer named Agabus. Then he'll travel to Jerusalem to complete the missionary journey. In Jerusalem, he will report to James, and later a riot will break out in the temple, precipitated by Jews from Ephesus, who claimed that Paul had brought Gentiles, Greeks, into the temple. This leads to Paul being seized by the Romans and imprisoned in the fortress Antonia. At trial, Paul presents his defense, is sentenced to be scourged, and is sentenced to be scourged, before which Paul invokes again his Roman citizenship. Now we can see the route on this map. Following the green route from Miletus southward to Patara, and thence on to the island of Cyprus. Finally, he arrives at Tyre, Ptolemais, Caesarea, and ultimately Jerusalem. So the third missionary journey begins in Antioch and Syria and ends in Jerusalem. <clears throat> the narrator quickly narrates the journey just described on the map. They set sail directly to Kos, then to Rhodes and on to Patera. Then they transferred ships to a boat going to Phoenicia, sighted Cyprus, passed it by, and continued on to Tyre in Syria, where the ship unloaded its cargo. During the unloading and reloading process, Paul seeks out some of the disciples who were in Tyre. Having found them, he stays there for a week. This group, as would others in this part of the journey, cautioned Paul about going to Jerusalem. This recalls the words of Paul in his farewell address to the elders in Miletus. The spirit, he says, testifies in every city that imprisonment and affliction await him in Jerusalem. When the week was over, they left Tyre, accompanied by the women and children of the city, till they were outside of the city. Paul and his companions then kneel down on the beach and pray with them, then make their final farewells. Paul and his company board the boat, and the townspeople return to their homes. From Tyre, they sailed to Ptolemais, where they greeted the brethren, remaining with them for one day. Ptolemais of Paul's day is actually the port city of Akko today. It was a center of glass manufacturing founded by Ptolemy II in 261 BC. It was renamed during the Crusades when a large crusader was, crusader city was built in honor of Jeanne d'Arc, 
that is Joan of Arc. The next day, they departed for Caesarea, where they entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. This is an aerial view of the modern city of Akko or Acre. You can see that its harbor has the shape of a parenthesis. That's matched today by a similar shape in the harbor at Haifa. Here we have a rather striking sunset over the Mediterranean in Akko. Here we have some pictures of the city of Caesarea, also known as Caesarea Maritima to distinguish it from Caesarea Philippi. This is the Crusader fortress at Caesarea. The sea is extremely striking along the shores of Caesarea. And finally, we have one can't miss site in Caesarea, the Roman aqueduct. It runs along the sea bringing water into the city. Most will understand the Philip that Paul visits in Caesarea to be Philip the deacon whom we met in chapter eight, significantly in the story about the Ethiopian eunuch. He's described as a proclaimer of good news, evangelistes, an evangelist, in other words. The direct connection to chapter six and eight comes when we're told that this Philip was one of the seven. It seems that after completing his mission in chapter eight, verse 40, Philip headed north, ending up in Caesarea. Paul remains with Philip then in Caesarea for a while. Luke goes on to note that this Philip now has four virgin daughters, designated by the Greek word Parthenos, a young woman. These daughters practiced prophecy. Kurtz think, thinks that this, is an ex, that this explicit me mention was connected to the prophecy of Peter on Pentecost, where, as we'll recall in chapter two, Peter cited the prophet Joel, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Now, during Paul's stay with Philip, another prophet appears on the scene, Agabus, who came from Jerusalem. Kurtz reminds us that this is the same Agabus who appeared in Acts 11, 27, and 28 foretelling a severe famine. He approaches Paul and his companions, supplementing his words with a prophetic action. Agabus takes Peter's belt. Using Paul's belt, Agabus binds his own hands and feet to show that thus will the Jews in Jerusalem bind Paul, whose belt Agabus uses. Then they will hand him over to the power of the Gentiles, that is the Romans. This is yet another iteration of the message that Paul had been hearing through this final part of the missionary journey. Many see a parallel to the passion of Jesus in the language used here. Agabus was careful to note <clears throat> that this was from the Holy Spirit. The reaction among those with Paul and the locals in Caesarea was to entreat Paul to remain in Caesarea and not go to Jerusalem. Paul counters, questioning what are the people doing by such an exhortation? Their weeping is breaking his heart, literally breaking into pieces from the Greek verb sunthrupto. He's going to Jerusalem and he's prepared not only to be bound but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. The outcry on the part of Paul, <clears throat> showing his firm resolve, showed the people that their exhortations would not be heeded. 
he wasn't persuaded in any way by them. So they became quiet and acceded to his wishes. May the will of the Lord be done. In this last part of the third journey, Paul is portrayed as very sympathetic, who, as Johnson notes, generated warmth and affection among his followers. So, after his time in Caesarea, Paul and his companions prepare for the journey and then embark upon that journey up to Jerusalem. They were accompanied by a number of the followers in Caesarea. From Caesarea, the 60 plus mile journey would take approximately four days. Upon arrival in Jerusalem, Paul was brought to the house of Nasson of Cyprus, who was described as an early disciple. This could mean that this Nasson was a disciple who came to faith in Jesus at a very early state of the development of the early Christian community. Paul and his companions were to stay in this disciple's house. The reception of Paul and his companions in Jerusalem was very cordial. In fact, they were glad to see him, as indicated by the verb asemnos, translated as gladly or with joy. Despite warnings and his own misgivings, Paul seems to have been accepted in Jerusalem. The next day, Paul goes to see James and the elders of the Jerusalem community. James, remember, was the leader and prime spokesman for the Jerusalem community. Paul greets them and then proceeds to narrate for them one by one the things that God had done through and his ministry to the Gentiles in the course of the third missionary journey. This language echoes the account of Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey that we saw in the Council of Jerusalem. When the, <clears throat> when the assembly heard the account of Paul, they gave glory to God. This echoes the response of the same group when earlier Paul had told them of his conversion of the house of Cornelius. In contrast to the Council of Jerusalem, the whole council answers Paul, rather than James alone. Then they recount to Paul the thousands of Jews who have come to believe. In the narrative of Acts, we have seen this. 241, 3,000 have come to believe. 4-4, four, four, 5,000. 6-7, more yet. These Jewish believers were zealous, that is, on fire for the law. The adjective that's translated as zealous, zelotes, has a double meaning. First and firm, foremost, it's translated here zealous for the observance of the law. They're careful to obey the law, but also it can, as Johnson puts it, be a jealousy for honor to be paid to the law, and consequently a hostility toward any perceived derogation of that honor. However, James notes that these zealous Jewish Christians have been told that Paul has been teaching that all, all the Jews who are among the Gentiles are to forsake Moses, his law, the Torah. Note that Paul is not accused of breaking the Torah here. Rather, he's teaching others to do so. This is similar to the charges brought against Stephen in chapter 7. In essence, those Jewish converts have heard that Paul is misleading the diaspora Jews. In particular, he's telling them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. 
There's no way that Paul could be guilty of these charges, however. Recall that he had Timothy circumcised in chapter 16, verse 3. He took a Nazarite vow at Shenkre in chapter 18, verse 18. And he has been careful to observe the feasts, Acts 25 and Acts 2017. Further, when one reads the letters of Paul, there's no indication that he advocated forsaking circumcision or the Jewish customs. So, what's to be done? The Jewish Christians who heard these falsehoods will certainly come to realize that the very same Paul is in their midst, and those among them who are zealous for the law will seek to be appeased by Paul's demonstration of piety. So James suggests a way of demonstrating that piety publicly. Do this, he says. There are four men in the community who have taken a vow, more than likely the Nazarite vow. Take them aside and purify yourself with them. Johnson notes that legislation concerning the vow foresees several cases in which ritual uncleanness could be contracted and thus the need for purification. So Paul then might be considered unclean. Or it may be so simple as Paul was considered unclean through his contact with the Gentiles. Further, Paul is to pay the expenses of these men so that they can shave their heads, which is required for the completion of the Nazarite vow. Kurtz adds, it was considered an act of Jewish piety to associate oneself with the vow of the Nazarites by paying their expenses. As a result, all will realize the things that they have been told about Paul have no merit. But rather, Paul does live in observance of the law. The verb to live by, stoikeo, has the sense of be in line with or belong in rank, which figuratively can mean live in accordance with. Now, the reasoning behind James's request is simple. Paul will not preach something which is contrary to his own practice. Thus, by observing this act of piety, Paul would refute the charges that his, that concerning his teaching. Thus, Paul is in line with the law. Then the topic turns to Gentile converts and recalls the aftermath of the Council of Jerusalem. Paul is reminded of the decision of the Council, which was communicated via the letter of Acts 15, 23 to 28. The fact that James bring this, brings this up has led some scholars to surmise that Paul and Barnabas had left the assembly when the letter was drafted. That fact is conjecture based on a repetition of the decision and mention of the letter here. Perhaps the repetition is to impress upon the readers of Acts the significance of that decision. James then speaks of the letter, which was sent according to Acts 15, communicating the decision of the council, namely, that Gentiles should abstain from food which has been sacrificed to idols, blood, what is strangled, and unchastity, or sexual immorality. Further, according to Acts 15.25, Paul was one of those charged with delivering this letter. Now, the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself with them and went into the temple. Note, the book of Numbers notes that the vow is completed at the tent of meeting. Numbers 6.13 the equivalent of the tent of meeting then was the temple. Bach notes that we see here Paul is being asked to act with cultural sensitivity to the Jewish context he now finds himself in. 
without compromising the gospel. He's quite willing to do so for the sake of the unity it will create. So Paul then gave notice of the completion of the period of purification and remained in the temple until the sacrifice was offered on behalf of each of them. Kurt's questions. Why Paul had to announce anything whatsoever? And answers his own question that the likeliest possibility is that he was required to announce in the sense of check off with some priest each day as each day of the purification has passed. Now, near the end of the prescribed period, a deliberately false report concerning Paul begins to circulate through the, the temple area. That is, that he has brought a Gentile into the temple precincts. This precipitates a riot and the eventual arrest of Paul. So, the seven days of purification are nearing completion. And a number of Jews from the province of Asia, that is, Ephesian Jews, saw Paul in the temple precincts. Now note, the Asian or Ephesian Jews were quite hostile toward Paul, as he had left Ephesus after a riot concerning his preaching, which had caused a significant drop in the economy, in particular in the sales of silver statues and religious articles. These Ephesian Jews took advantage of the larger crowds in Jerusalem for the feast and began to agitate the crowd. Johnson notes that the volatility of the great crowds at the pilgrimage feast, where a perceived slight against the ancestral customs could quickly generate a riot that required suppression by military authorities. Thus, Paul is attacked by the crowd at the instigation of these Ephesian Jews, who cry out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone, everywhere, against the people. We see these Asian Ephesian Jews as informants against the law and against this place. Note, this parallels the charges brought against Stephen earlier in the book of Acts. But that's not all. He has profaned, that is, made common between Jew and Gentile, this place. More precisely, he has led Greeks or Gentiles into the temple. That is, he's brought Gentiles beyond the outer court of the temple, where they are allowed. But, is for, but are forbidden under the penalty of death to enter into any inner court. That is where Paul allegedly brought Gentiles. Here, we have a drawing of the Temple of Jerusalem. Gentiles were not allowed beyond the white area surrounding the court of the Israelites, the extreme outer area. Thus they, could, thus, they could only be, port, be in the portico area. The precise infraction of the law by Paul is now described. These Ephesian Jews had seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul. We know this because Acts 20, 20, verse 4, lists a number of Asian followers who were in Jerusalem with Paul. The author of Acts then notes that these Jews immediately jumped to the conclusion that Paul had brought one of these Asian followers, Trophimus, into the inner regions of the temple precincts, that is, the court of the Israelites, where they were not allowed, thereby desecrating the temple it's clear that this conclusion is patently false. To see someone in the city does not immediately imply that they were in the temple.
This accusation incites the whole city and is a bit of an exaggeration, I surmise, who run together, seize Paul, and drag him out of the temple precincts. And at once the gates were shut. Johnson feels that the closing of the gates makes good sense, since the keepers of the temple close the gates once the polluter has been expelled from it in order to keep the riot outside the sacred precincts. But Luke may see a deeper shutting out in that action. It could symbolize Paul as marked as an outsider to the cultic life of Judaism and as a, as a result of his encounter with Christ. The riot took on a more serious tone when the rioters were trying to kill Paul, causing word to be sent to the tribune of the cohort that something needs to be done as all of Jerusalem is in turmoil or confusion. Later in Acts 23, 2, we learn that this, this tribune was one Claudius Lysias. So the tribune gathers the soldiers and the centurions. As an aside, the word that is translated tribune refers to a leader of a thousand. Zerwick notes that he's a military officer with the rank of colonel. Thus we see the Roman presence in Jerusalem was quite large, which was necessary due to the volatility of Palestine during this period. The soldiers rush down toward the rioters, who upon seeing them stop beating Paul. The tribune then approaches Paul, apprehends him, and orders him bound with two chains. He's thus bound to a soldier on either side of him. It should be noted that from this point on, Paul will constantly be accompanied by Roman soldiers. Then, the tribune questions who Paul was and what he had done. At the same time, different people in the crowd were shouting different things. This parallels in many ways the riot of the silversmiths. Being unable to get the facts or firm knowledge because of the tumult, the crowd that is, shouting all sorts of things, it should be noted that the word translated in some texts as truth here is different from the normal Greek word for truth. It is asphales rather than aletheia. Asphales denotes facts as opposed to hearsay. The phrase gnonai to asphales has the sense of get at the facts. Thus, the tribune orders that Paul be led into the barracks, that is, the fortress Antonia, which overlooked the temple area. This is a picture of the Fortress Antonia. It is a four-towered edifice that sits on the northwest corner of the Temple Mount. Situated in that spot, it's easy for the governor and his soldiers to keep watch on the temple area. The temple would be on the extreme right of the picture. Note also, this would be the place where the Roman governor resided when he was in Jerusalem. When those accompanying Paul reached the steps of the fortress Antonia, they were forced to physically carry Paul as the crowd was becoming quite violent. An assembled mob group was following them, crying out, away with him. This is reminiscent of the crowds gathered at the pilot scene with Jesus, who shout, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Paul sees that things are getting quite out of hand, so he requests to speak to the tribune. May I say something to you, he says. Claudius Lysias, the, the tribune, responds, do you know Greek? Note, proceedings of this sort between Romans and Jews 
usually took place in Greek, which was the lingua franca of the region, not in Aramaic nor in Latin, which might have been expected. Seemingly, Claudius Lysias had taken Paul for an Egyptian revolutionary who had stirred up some 4,000 assassins and led them into the desert. But now he realizes that this is not the case. The word used for assassin here is sicarios, which refers to one who used a sica or a dagger to kill. It's also the term which was used to describe zealots. The backstory here is Josephus had recounted that about three years before this, an Egyptian had gathered 30,000 and led them to the Mount of Olives. At his word, the walls would fall. When that did not occur, the Romans killed many of that army, but the Egyptian escaped. This is somewhat, this is somewhat similar to a few departures that we've heard of. Acts as an army of 4,000 who are led into the desert. Paul's response, given his ethnic heritage, is I am a Jewish man of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. It will be recalled that Tarsus was a university city and the capital of the Roman province of Cilicia. As such, it was a center of Hellenistic philosophy, especially Stoicism. Having given his heritage, Paul requests that Claudius Lysias give him permission to speak to the people. The tribune gives him leave to speak to the crowd. Thus, Paul stands on the steps of the barracks, motioned with his hand to the people, which is part of a rhetorical style meant to quiet a noisy mob. All at once, they were quiet, and he begins to address them in the Hebrew dialect, most likely spoken Aramaic. Well, that's about all we have time for in this session. Next time, we'll begin with what Paul said to the crowd that wanted to lynch him. Then we'll look at Paul's invocation of his Roman citizenship and conclude with Paul's hearing before the Sanhedrin. See you then.